Greetings, Klausowitz here. So in this video I want to talk about great swords, specifically about the uh, swords which were around in the late medieval era and in the Renaissance. And this is the topic often and continuously discussed inside of the HEMA community, also um, in communities about military history or general military enthusiasm. And um, especially about the question how were they used regarding um, the way like how do you as a single person would like use and apply which techniques you would apply on such a sword but also how were they used in the battlefield by armies and of course uh, being in the Clausewitz channel concentrating on this whole military army theme um, not about so much like how do you can or uh, should or even how back then they used those individually but I will actually like go a little bit into the study direction as well. First of all before I kind of start with arguing my view on this whole thing I want to address some statements I actually hear repeatedly, uh, repeatedly throughout the internet basically. The first statement is they were for cutting off the pike heads so we all most of us know that when those swords were around, basically mercenary warfare or organized mercenary warfare was pretty much the dominant way of waging war and they had those massive formations with pikemen in there. And it's often argued that oh, maybe it were that for cutting off the pike heads because it's a big sword and everything can cut well and so on. Uh, but actually many people um, also actually tested this out and I think Thrand will be soon testing such a thing, he is like implying that in a comment somewhere on a video and um, but the thing is that actually also uh, other YouTubers tested this out with like normal spears and this is extreme, also Mid Eastern Observatory actually talked about this. this is extremely difficult and very unlikely to cut off a spearhead and pikes were often thicker as a spear even though pikes actually get thinner towards the head because that the whole spear or the whole weapon doesn't bend towards the ground but they were also most of the times reinforced with those langets how, how they were called those uh, metal straps which were then like um, connecting the head as well with the shaft so basically this is then uh, also part of steel around there and like I said this is so unlikely to really cut off as a pie cat and to really just dedicate people with specific weapons to do this seems much like a waste and also even if they were successfully with many uh, cutting off pike heads actually that doesn't mean that now the pikes are useless uh, actually a pike can do its job without having a real head so being just blunt basically and but I will talk about this in a more dedicated pike video a second statement is they were for clearing out the pikes or the pikemen um, this is kind of interesting. I mean, um, the thing is, this actually has like also like two opinions or major opinions here. Some are saying, okay, they were really there for killing pikemen so that actually other infantry can go in and you could like destroy the pike formation. And others claim they actually like kind of um, just swing, as a not just swing, but use their swords to actually move out the pikes out of the way so they can get they can get in, and then use shorter weapons to actually fight or grabbing it in a half sorting way. And this, I would say, there are some truth parts in it, but also some rubbish ones. I mean, first of all, this whole this is an idea also promoted by Lindy Beige basically um, that. You kind of like swing them in this uh, this A-shaped movement to smash the spikes away. But my biggest thing with this is this could actually be useful to like enter the wall of pikes because you have then this head before and you can actually push some yeah, away with this long lever of course and go in. But the problem is that there are like different rows of pikes then and you are in the pike formation there are some pikes before you some of the heads of course and there are already pikes you passed around you and when you start swinging you would hit all of these and you would lose momentum and you can't just move your sword through the pikes and this is where i say i can't see this work at all maybe like i said to enter initially the pikes but i don't see a point in swinging the sword as big movements inside the formation because you can't you just can't swing the sword around there and this is what I mean, but I think there is some truth in like clearing a path in it, but I will address this in my view uh, part of the video. Another statement is that they were like always 
in the second line of the formation. And this is and basically like this is then more discussion towards where where they positioned and then they would just attack from there or charge from there or basically attack out of the formation maybe. And some argue, okay, you can't really use a big sword inside those formations and everything, and you need to pikemen. And this is where I have to say, actually, this is an application. There were many different kinds of troop arrangement of organization of formation types throughout this late period, medieval period and renaissance. Um, there were different kinds of organizing or mercenaries like the Swiss um, style, I just call it style here, um, the Landsknecht style, um, the Treccio, tre tre I can't pronounce correctly the Spanish style when you want to, and this even has a lot of stages throughout history. And also there were some like Italian uh, way of doing, also a Netherlandic or Hollandic, I don't know how to call it here. Uh, and also like a Swedish version of the improvement of the Netherlandic, and so on so on. So basically how those troops were organized and how were which weapon type positioned can be very different. And this was actually um, a Landsknecht way of doing it, like a second row behind the first row of pikemen, you had people with zwei handers with their this like German style of greatsword, but also with other uh, like melee weapons for like more close quarter combat, not like pikes. And but I will address this as well. But the thing is, this is a yes and no question. Yes, some formations did this. Some put their zwei or the greatswords behind the first row. Some didn't, <laughs> and. But this is like typical in those discussions that people want to like choose one extreme statement or one extreme truth and like go with it. This is this is how it had to be every time and so on and so on. And this is rarely the case about most other things in life. Um, not only military. But yeah, I will now come to my view. So what I think, I think the great swords and actually, I'm, re I'm, I'm referring mostly to zwei Händler, so to like the German, Biedenhänder, Biedenhänder, how you want to call it, but like the, the German um, great sword. Because actually, the Spanish and Italian one are not so much well, not so much used anymore, and actually not so often used inside of their mercenary formations. I will address those at the end a little bit. But yeah, the thing is, I think zwei Händlers had basically two roles on the battlefield. The first was to for uh, shock attacking enemy mercenary pike formations and the second where to um, engage in the melee after the formations engage with each other in the pike formations and actually pikes kind of get used this or those mercenaries basically stop using them throughout the fight. If you're not familiar with like the concept of shock attacking or shock tactics, um, basically how it's mostly referred to and how I actually use this term then check out my um, shock tactics video. So. When I say like there were shock attacks, and um, the thing is, um, I would say they were like sent out out of the formation before two formations would really meet each other. And of course, this takes a little bit of discipline that they really can out get out smoothly so that not the formation is like um, gets in too much disorder and such. But they would get out and attack the enemy at first, and they may be used like this H-shaped um, style of movement to get past the first pikes. But after that, they can actually shovel their way through. I mean, they have a big sword with a big cross guard and everything, and you can of course get through it. And they wear armor. Actually, the guys with the best salary would have basically be the swordsman guys uh, with the side handers. Actually, they also um, had to prove that they could handle a great sword or a side hander. Um, with like a certification they get from um, a certain uh, organization, the, the Marx Bruderschaft I was thing, and like a proof, oh yeah, I'm trained and I can handle a great sword and everything. But basically, this was also a dangerous task, and therefore you demanded more money. Um, basically, guys with zwei handers had basically more money or gathered more money throughout their. Um, career so that they would get at this point now and could afford more armor um, so and the pike can't punch through your armor and of, co of course your face is always very da endangered here but you can then manage to actually defend your face and not every pike can get to your face they're very long they you are blocking some pikes with your body so it's not so difficult of course some were injured some died in there but like I said it was a dangerous job it's not so that nobody died but uh, it was of course possible to get through and then when you're basically in range of the first guys you then attack them of course either way with downward swings I mean this is possible the pikes are around here and so but you can go to the pikes even if they would be pretty close and they aren't like a wall, literally wall or worn, wall of pikes they are have 
they have gaps in there. Or you get this half sorting style and attack those guys. And even if they were armored, actually a hard hit with just such a uh, long lever on a helmet can like break your, uh, break your neck or actually if you get hit and your skull doesn't crack and your neck holds, your brain still moves and clashes against uh, the inside of your skull, which is not pleasant, can also lead to injuries and death and unconsciousness and stuff like this. So this is not to underestimate that if you have a helmet to get a hard hit on your head. But also many people weren't armored when they had pikes and often they had basic, basic armor like for the torso and so on. And not necessary for arms and hands. So you can also attack the arms of those guys holding the pikes in some way and can therefore um, disable them of using pikes. So some of the pikemen will of course start drawing their uh, swords or daggers or just short weapons because they want to defend themselves against those crazy guys with the great swords. But this is actually a good thing because now they have to drop those pikes. And now other guys from behind with shorter weapons or with halberds, which is basically shorter weapon than a pike, would come forth to of course deal with those crazy uh, great sword guys. But this is also good because this causes some disorder in the formation. So people getting in front uh, before the pikes, pikes get dropped, some pikemen have to like lift their pikes because people are pushing around and everything and so on and so on. And the Zweihander guys wouldn't stay there and like fight there or till the uh, own guys are there. It's just they would perish. So they would get in as quick as possible, attack some guys, wound them, maybe kill them, bring in this order in, bring them to like dropping the pikes and then they would left. This is really just a quick hard attack. And then they would left and even and, and maybe get in the formation in the front if they're very disciplined or get like around the formation from the side or even from behind. Also depends on how broad the formation is or if they have multiple uh, pike formations attacking. This was also different from, from army to army situation, situation, like how they would apply on a really on a big battle or things. And uh, yeah, so or maybe you make such, such uh, some gaps between the formations they can get through which you can maybe get more easily close. And then basically your own formation would attack and now they have an advantage because some of the enemies don't have their pikes up and there is some disorder and so you could reach your pike with your pikes enemy beforehand and so on. And this is just an advantage in general. Doesn't mean you will win but you have an advantage and this is pretty uh, of course important. And but we see actually that zwei Henders kind of disappeared throughout the time and so on and so on. They were kind of used to the Thirty Years' War, but very rarely, very specific. And I can imagine that at the height of the usage of the popularity, this was one of the main reasons or main roles on the battlefield. But also those like shock um, great sword guys can also be used to lure an enemy out of a position or to provoke him from attacking when they approach. Maybe the enemy thinks then, oh, I want to like get rid of those guys very quick and so on and so on. So maybe approach it, but this can be actually be also an advantage for the enemy formation. But this is more related to the fall on hope concept. And I don't want to go into too much detail in here. I will talk about this whole fall on hope, what it is and uh, how it can be done. But, uh, uh, in a certain video. I will make videos about the uh, mercenaries of this time. There's also where I bring in the fallen hope stuff. But just that you know, this, this can also be done. There is a relation between great swords and the fallen hope also, but um, not necessary. It's not like this is uh, very about the fallen hope. This was just like um, also done for this concept. So the second role I mentioned, the melee or melee after the formation engage. Uh, you have to imagine basically when those formations engage, the pikes were really more for a defensive purpose. They were there so to like um, secure the formation against cavalry charges but also of course for outreaching enemy infantry so that you can of course basically hold them at bay and maybe also cause some damage before and so that uh, actually some guys with some um, smaller weapons can then deliver killing power like coming forth between those pikes. This is what I meant before, like this is one type of organization basically how early Landsknecht did it. They had like a first row of pikemen and then they had guys with zwei handers with just swords and shields or just with an axe with halberds and stuff like that and they would basically after this formations engaged would come forth and attack with their weapons to really kill people and so on and so on of course the pikemen would also start at some point 
getting a sword or dagger because the formation is coming too close after us and because of people pushing and stuff like this. And like I say, a pike is not so lethal, it's just there for stopping and defending. And basically after those melee guys you had also pi uh, rows of pikemen again. Not only for supporting basically because they're very long weapons and you can hold them in this up way so you can actually when like the first pikemen's had their short weapons ready, the second guys had basically with zwei handers with habits were ready as already in combat, you could help those guys with your pikes. Um, pike, piking, poking or thrusting in their information. And also um, maintain the, for the function of the uh, formation because if the enemy was disengaged and then maybe another formation would come or there was flee or whatever or then cavalry comes in you still have enough pikes to counter those cavalry guys the uh, guys in the front can go in there and have the advantage still the advantage of the pikes and of course the halberds also can do some damage also the swiners can they be used then for defending against those cavalry men and this is what I mean, this was the way of doing it actually, that, and this was actually how you would then fight. Um, this wasn't Landsknecht wise, Swiss wise, wasn't just pikes, this was much later on, more in this whole Spanish kind of organization, and also more in the Swedish one, and then more in the English one, in the Civil War and so on, that basically you the only melee uh, or great weapon, basically were pikes, uh, but this way when basically arquebusiers and musketeers were at had like more usage or better, better saying um, were more effective and then more relied on those guys and but as, like I said I will talk about all those formations how they waged war and fought all their, battle, their battles in all, own videos on their own but basically yeah this was typical Landsknecht they had some zweihander guys there which would also engage them afterwards in vain this could be the same guys which are shock attacking but like I said this doesn't mean that this was always the case this was done by the formations which had enough great swords or experienced great sword guys or maybe if they would prefer it or can do it I mean if you would see that like, maybe the enemy has another arrangement or uh, is like numbers wise uh, otherwise organized you maybe don't want to just send in those great swords. You just then let, let them in and use them for the melee. Maybe um, they even get rid of the great swords at a point before because it's like, oh, do we want to use them beforehand? No, we don't want. Okay, I just like let it be, let it hear the great sword and use my halberd or just use a sword or whatever. So, like I said, it doesn't mean that this was every time how they were used when they were around. They could be much more like also what the commander had preferred. Like he's maybe not so, had not well experienced with great swords before. Maybe they caused too much disorder and everything. They are all too fair and so disciplined. So he didn't uh, use them for the shock attacks and just keep them there and let them fight in the melee if they want. And he doesn't care then about so much. And yeah. But there's another thing, and this is what I said in the beginning on to address slightly the like the individual usage of those swords. They were actually always by the, in the Landsknecht formations in, uh, like a specific guard for the flag, always. They would stand there with the swords at the flag in the center of the formation to defend the flag. Maybe in this, like, like I said, they needed a certification, they had a higher salary and stuff like this, so basically they were more of the elite guys, or among the elite guys of the army, of the veterans. And so this could be like, of course, an honor position, but maybe deriving from that, that also those guys were actually good fighters, and if most of the formation would crumble, they could actually, with wide swings, maybe hold off enough enemies from the flag, but also can attack in close combat as well because or defend basically well because of this big lever, this half sorting stuff, the big cross guard and so on. And and now we come to the uh, relation to the Itali Italian Spadon, Spadon, and not sure, but like the it Italian great sword and the um, Spanish or Iberian, we think it's not only Spanish, also Portuguese, um, Montante. Which basically are great swords, they're great here, as uh, long swords and everything. But what we see, and this is kind of interesting, we actually see not such uh, a complicated cross guard. I mean, often the zwei handers had basically also rings on the sides, had very long, um, some curved um, cross guards. Why we see on Montantes typically really is normal cross guard, and actually the Spadon, Spadon, Spadon. Padron, I think it's Padron, <laughs> but the Italian uh, sword also has very, a very simple classical cross guard. Also, we see that the uh, great sword, uh, the Zweihander, had of course this um, two 
Parierhaken is it in German, but like this two quillens um, on the blade, which um, also of course could be used to defend the hand or protect the hand if you would uh, start holding it in this manner and everything. And this were not much around on the other swords and if there it was very like little, not so elaborated as well, but often really missing. And another thing what um, is notable is that basically most zweihanders were kind of broad towards the whole of the blade. You actually see pieces which have really a round um, point. And you don't see this at, at the Montante. The Montante and also the um, Spadron had really a narrow point and, and they were well balanced actually. Much more, actually much lighter. It would really taper much. Um, so they were lighter and better balanced, like a long sword basically, in contrary to the great sword. Great sword were much more like a slashing weapon. And of course, it also this capability of defending yourself properly, and so this indicates kinda how they were used and for what reason basically. Because like I said, the great sword you want to swing it uh, like upwards on somebody and really hit somebody with it, and maybe use just a half sorting or when you half sword, and then use it more also like a halberd maybe and slashing with it. While the montante and the spadron also we have manuals for it suggest a more individual usage against multiple opponents with different weapons and you have to defend them against them and basically this was also a weapon often used by like guardsmen or like bodyguards also by like those uh, guard guard soldiers for like a lord or so on and this is also something we see with the zweihanders this was what i mentioned before they were used also to guard the flag and this is actually a role also in german lands the zweihander was used later on you actually see this uh, with the swiss guard at the vatican still they use like two zweihanders for like um, for ceremony um, purpose. This was what the zweihander was still used for, even though it disappeared on the battlefield, and um, also used by guards. And this seems also be the case with the montante and the spadron. They were more used for guardsmen, for really bodyguards, or for like I said, for noblemen, that they would go beside them, and when they were attacked, or if they were attacked, they can with those big swings, and also with this very not so heavy blade and also very well balanced blade of course handle it very quickly without tire tiring and they have very good control about it this is what all the manuals suggest also in Italian there we see much more like sword against sword which also indicates more dualish side of things but yeah you see what I want to say here so this seems that this is more going like after the swords went out of fashion because actually Landsknecht, Landsknechte were pretty much early on there, so when this whole mercenary thing starts. And the whole Spanish and Italian and the Netherlands uh, mercenaries came later on, they already didn't use such things anymore like the greatsword, they even used more and more pikes. And we see the greatsword then only appear as those individual like guard weapons, um, or bodyguard weapons, or for ceremony purposes, like with the Zweihander. And yeah, this is basically my take on it and what I think is the most um, usage out of it. Um, I get all those points, or basically all this knowledge out of like statements of historians. Some historians just like have stating this about the Zweihanda. We don't have so many better reports basically how they were used there. But we have regards um, about the Fallen Hope, we know that they were around in the formation. We of course have the so the, the relic of the time or the artifact, I think it's artifacts and relic and artifact is basically something created by humans back in history. So we have okay found those of course. Also have the manuals for the Spanish things. It's not like I thought all of this on my own, this is what I mean, like to actually clear pikemen and everything. I heard this from historians before, but this is where I also agree on. This makes pretty much sense when regard all the circumstances they were in. Also I want to mention, it could be also a hint about this whole wanting to kill or clear pikemen, so clear out pikes out of formation. Base, uh, um, a historical name for the Zweihänder, the German Zweihänder, is also Gassenhauer. Gassenhauer means something like, a uh, Gasse is like, is like a corridor, and uh, Hauer means like slasher or striker. And so basically the name suggests like, oh it was there for striking in like, uh, corridors inside of the formation where you could go in or basically clearing out pikes so it would build as a formal corridor. 
Could be, I'm not so sure how old this name is, could be just made up like 100 years ago where it wasn't used anymore, but could be really out of the time. Just like that you know, this is something which suggests this. Not such a huge point, I think, like all the other points I made about it. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video, let me know what you think about this and check out my other videos and like I said I will make videos about mercenaries, about Landsknechte, Swiss Guardsmen, the Spanish guys I can't pronounce and about Netherlands uh, styles, about the Swedes. Is it Swedes? I hope it's Swedes. Um, later on, Anta Gustav Adolf, really great guy. But yeah, I will do this all but it will take some time of course but hopefully you enjoyed this and if so please like it, subscribe to my channel if you not already did and hopefully see you soon.